Anyway, uh, today uh, I have invited Dr. Frank Sisson and Bogdan uh, Klied uh, to present to us some really interesting research that they've been working on. Um, there, as I explained to you in the previous class, there was an, an ethnographer, Father Mikhail Zabritsky, who was uh, in the uh, researching uh, in the Galicia um, Boyko area of Ukraine, which is in western Ukraine, uh, specifically in an area, in a, a, a village called Mishanets. And once those materials were uncovered, um, Frank Sisson was um, involved in putting the material together, and Bogdan Klied uh, was involved in following up on a very specific uh, carol, Christmas carol, that was uncovered after um, so many years, and, and what has happened with it now. So it, it leads from our conversation about folklore gathered in the past, and then how and why we do it, and how it's um, applied now when we uncover it. And so I'm going to turn it over to Frank to talk, and we'll sure. hopefully have quiet entries from other students. Right. So I, I understand that this is a general ethnography and folklore course, and you are not Ukrainian specialists. Uh, so I'm not going to burden you with endless Ukrainian names that you know, won't be remembered anyway and try and get to the major themes and hope that some of you may follow it up uh, by looking at the volumes, although most of it's in Ukrainian, they have English introductions to these volumes and I'll be mentioning them and why I'm involved. But first to start out, I think, with one of our major topics. Uh, you see me in the usual Ukrainian embroidered shirt but this embroidered shirt is one that comes specifically from the region we will be discussing. And it, in fact, is a model of a 140-year-old sh shirt that someone found, which I'll, is an artifact which is now, you can't legally take it out of Ukraine, which is a good thing. Uh, but in the region itself, these kinds of embroidery models have been replaced by other more generalized Ukrainian models, the very popular model of the Hutsul region. So one of the things we face in dealing with earlier cultural forms is what is kept, what is changed, and what is replaced, particularly as cultures then become more homogenized or models take over in it. So that's why I'm so proud of the colors of the shirts. We're going back to a period from around 1875 to 1919, which is extremely important in the development of ethnography and folklore studies for Central and Eastern Europe, for those areas of Galicia and Austria-Hungary. And all, everybody Google a map, please, if you don't have them deeply in your mind. Once they were deeply in the mind of all the people who lived in East Central Alberta because they all knew exactly which village they came from and would have followed that model from Austria-Hungary. What we're dealing with is a project uh, of a <coughs> micro-ethnographic historical project and also one uh, involved with document publication and with political history of those times. So this is indeed extremely multidisciplinary, and I myself am a historian. I'm not trained at all as an ethnographer and folklorist, and I worked back into it. But in a certain way, it recreates our interdisciplinary uh, approach, recreates the reality of how all of this ethnographic material was collected. Uh, they had a field called ethnography that's developing at that time. Anthropology begins to be developed. And sociology comes in just at this period. Uh, but people are largely trained to be classical historians, study Le Greek and Latin text, and that's what they know how scholarship works, and particularly those that are not in these fields. Father Zabritsky, of course, studied theology and the usual classical uh, development of that time when he was at the University of Lviv in western Ukraine. Uh, and followed that much in his life. What, what this collection is, which is really quite <coughs> unique uh, uh, that we've been able to be put out, 
because so much is lost in the area we're dealing with for all the reasons you know, and of course you see it all too graphically and horrifically, the destruction of the Russian missiles in Ukraine now, how many archives, how many churches uh, go over to Rutherford Library and you'll see the churches that are being destroyed and how are they going to be redone. Now what we've produced for Father Zabritsky is uh, three volumes, volume one of which, and I'll be passing them around, and it's nice to have nice books, and these are beautifully done books, but these are largely his scholarly articles uh, that he published in scholarly journals about history, ethnography, uh, uh, there are maps that are involved in it, and that was the first we put out in our project. And then we had the great fortune that Father Zubritsky's personal archive was saved when he was arrested, his neighbor saved it, and when his son later was arrested and sent to Siberia, neighbors saved what was left of that archive. And I want you to think of those things, we are where we get our materials from, how they are preserved. And uh, we were fortunate to get that, and they, among them there is his personal notebook that he kept as a student. Uh, you will see a facsimile in the middle of, of this book that's worth looking at on, as we put out his letters and other things. And he kept his own bibliography, which was very convenient for us. But why is the, this book so important? Because what you find in it is he's copying great authors, right? People didn't, you know, text, there was no, 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 no photocopy machine, no digitalization. You wrote in these books these kind of things. And then, Next to it, you will find, you know, I was over by so-and-so's house, and Mrs. So-and-so repeated this song that she had heard when she was a young girl. And it's written on the side. Right? So it's a way that you're gathering together material that we now look as invaluable folklore material in the midst of this very combined genre. And the final one, he was a indefatigable politician, writer for newspapers, and he put out hundreds of articles in newspapers, but he also left behind uh, extremely interesting materials in archives. And the one you will be hearing about at the end of the lecture is uh, a number of carols, and I don't say Christmas carols because they are seasonal carols of, the, of those holidays about which uh, Dr. Cleed will speak. So this was the third of our volume. People are asking you about volume four. I'm going to leave it for posterity for someone else to take over volume four. There's still material to be put out. OK, so those are what we worked on over a decade of gathering together, putting this together. Artifacts are extremely important for people related to it. Uh, I can send you the PDF files. Uh, scholars will be perfectly happy. But the people who are intrinsically related to this culture love these books. They want to see the book. It will come from this region. This is extremely important that it is put out in a proper way. So we are dealing with Galicia. At a point, it is part of Austria-Hungary. And Austria-Hungary was ruled by what dynasty? And I won't make you sort of chant that at Habsburgs out, but remember the Habsburgs, extremely important for this region. Uh, and the people we're dealing with were at that time largely called Ruthenians, but were beginning to change their name to Ukrainians to have the same name that the people in the Russian Empire had. And that switch was important. The region is a region in which ethnographically we say that people were boykos. Uh, and Boykos is a kind of dialect, a way you speak Ukrainian. It also had all kinds of lifestyle uh, ways. It was in the mountains. People are frequently shepherds and not agriculturalists in the traditional way. Uh, and uh, it's a very specific culture that maintained itself. And mountain areas often are wonderful treasure troves of old ways, right? They isolated valleys are good ways to keep cultures separately. So Father Zubritsky came from this region, not specifically the village of Mshanets, but not far away. He, he uh, becomes a first 
he marries in, and of course the important thing is that Greek Catholic priests could marry and had families. He marries the granddaughter of a priest and gets the parish later. He's first uh, uh, there, and he spends 30 some years in that parish where the snows are deep in the winter, uh, roads are not easy, uh, and uh, there are no easy ways uh, initially of even having typewriters as people wrote out text by hand. One of the things that, uh, on the other hand, by the 1870s and 80s, unlike Canada Post, the uh, Austro-Hungarian Post worked. You could actually put a, a letter in to be sent and send it to a major city in a newspaper and get it there in remarkable time. And he's send, writing articles to send off to city papers who want this information, and they want information for various regions. Now, I've pointed out the various fields that we're dealing with in this discussion. So we are dealing with ethnography, and I'm sure you've, you've, you've discussed you know, where the word comes from. What does it mean to the average person, ethnography? Ethnography means writing down about an ethnos, and an ethnos is a people, a culture, or a nation, you know, coming from Greek, right? So you are describing this group and, you know, the writing from the, the, this on it. So this ethnography, which becomes an extremely important discipline now and, and that enters university curriculum and above all museum life, is important for this region. More difficult to describe what folklore meant to these people. Uh, the, the most common way people thought of it, and everyone who thought academically at this time thought in German, this was Volkskunde. It was the study of the people. And that people largely meant not the elite classes of the population, of the general people, almost all of whom, uh, 80, 90% in most of these societies, are rural people, agriculturalists, uh, some of them in Eastern Europe, not even free until uh, relatively late in the century. In 1848, the last remnants of what might be called serfdom are done away with in this region. Uh, and that changes their life. I pointed out the other disciplines that become of importance, but one I don't point out because no one thought of it at that time is oral history. And in fact, we have created whole modern fields of oral history, but the people of the 19th century actually conducted oral history in an immense ways because they, of course, had to gather this material. And this material uh, w was in the time before there were any recorders to record down and were la was largely gathered by listening to someone and someone taking down notes and dictation. So we will turn <laughs> to oral history. Now the question is, why does this priest do this? You know, he, you know priests uh, have to have a lot of liturgical services, endless amounts of holidays to do, and if you lived in these areas and you were married as well, you also had you know, your own farm and plot and things to do. You know, and there were many priests who, of course, that other than that, devoted their rest of their time to playing various interesting card games by visiting the priests in the next village. And we know little about them and their villages as a result. But Father Zubritsky was not that kind of priest. He was what in Ukrainian we tend to call a populist, and it's a very difficult word. Populism now means something very different in English than it once meant. Populism now are usually associated with radical ideologies, some of them tending towards uh, authoritarian rule, uh, playing upon the masses' feelings, and often related to what we might call chauvinism. So populism has become a pretty bad word, really, uh, for us, and quite deservedly so, I think. Uh, but populism, at this point, really came from this concept of the people. And it meant that one should pay attention to the culture, life, and well-being of regular people, not only of elites, not only of educated classes and professionals. And overwhelmingly, since these societies were rural and agriculture, 
it meant that those people who did produce the basic food on which society lived had a culture and life that was worthy and also should have rights. And remember, throughout this 19th century, one of the issues are the expansion of what was then overwhelmingly only male suffrage, but at least suffrage for voting, that you would have rights in the society, that you would become citizens. And so that, this kind of populism that Zubritsky believed in meant that it was the duty of groups of the population. And this, in some ways, came from the left, from those people who were Marxists and leftists and believed that you needed revolution, indeed, to change society. They later become very interested in the working classes and the changing cities. But you know, they also have to deal with rural areas, although Marxism has great problems with, it, with that generally. They also come from the right. There, are, there is Catholic social theory that becomes extremely important by the end of the 19th century. You know, how will we do something? And, and people talk in religious terms uh, that the church is for all of us, the rich and the poor. But the rich do not need us, and the poor do. And so we will serve them. And it hits the Anglican church. There's a whole change and revival within them. So Zubritsky and his seminarians, who go to study at the university and study theology, become a generation around the 1870s because of these new in, uh, influences in society that believe they should serve the people. And so when they go to their parish, uh, they're not only to say liturgical and religious functions, but they are to spread literacy in a society that is largely still illiterate in, in these kind of areas. They are to help their congregations improve their way of life. And, and they view that improvement is, that economic improvement should be related to as well spiritual and cultural improvement. And that they should give those societies the right to demand their rights. Uh, one of the great reasons why you want to be literate is you can begin to write petitions to say, you know, you sent extra tax, taxes on, to our village and we don't want to pay them and we shouldn't have to pay them. So that's the core of Zubritsky's thought. Now, uh, fortunately, you came after uh, University of Alberta got rid of one of its, I think, less successful uh, slogans or branding. For a while, we had uplifting all the people as our goal, you know, on those silly banners that they make us put up. Uh, but, uh, but in a certain way, that was a populist concept. You know, the university should be at the service of the broader population uh, of Alberta. Uh, they also had changed the concept of what was valued in culture. So if we can say in the, in the late Enlightenment, uh, Europe was basically thought that everyone should be lifted to a generalized culture that would be modern, that often would be uh, done in elite languages, French being the major language, and that would make people more similar. What happens in the, in the 19th century after romanticism and new visions, <coughs> diversity became a positive idea. Many languages, each, had its own, each would have its own culture, its own tradition that is of value and therefore be kept. So suddenly you have a world where instead of saying our goal is that everybody be the same in many ways, is what do you have that can contribute to humanity's general improvement? What is special about you? Uh, and in that, frequently, uh, the idea was that your unique, the uniqueness was better kept by those populations that were not literate, were in the countryside, who had often kept older traditions that had disappeared in the towns and cities. And we should find out about them and then see why they are of use. But there was a special element of this for Zubritsky and the other Ukrainians. It was one thing if you had a state. France had a state, French language. You, you propagated this language 
you destroyed local languages so that, that they would have the main language, but you had already had schools that taught you you were French. There's a wonderful book by Weber, Peasants into Frenchmen, to discuss you know, how French identity is spread uh, to a general population. Uh, but you already had, had knew what you, where you fit in that time a largely European community and what France was. But the peoples who didn't have states and whose languages frequently were discriminated against were struggling that they too should be recognized. Poles didn't have a state in the 19th century. They had been divided by other countries. Slovaks did not have a state. And Ukrainians did not as well, even though they existed in two empires and there were very many of them. And so what you were also doing is trying to get your people to join the community of nations. You go out to our Ukrainian people in the countryside. Even the cities were frequently in this area of Ukraine, non-Ukrainian speaking, either Polish speaking, Yiddish speaking, German speaking. Uh, Ukrainians were moving into these cities. But the goal of these ethnographers is also to say, we are going to cre create a Ukrainian culture that will stand alongside German culture and French culture and Italian <coughs> culture in, among the European cultures. The other part of Zubritsky's line was that scholarship could be useful. He came into a conflict with one of the greatest of the Ukrainian writers and intellectuals, Ivan Franko, who believed that uh, the way ahead was that they should just support scholarly research. You don't care what the significance is. But if you were sitting a priest in a mountain village, you wanted, and you had to go to your congregation who are having a hard time scratching a living out of uh, not the most productive of soils, you, and you're trying to convince them to send their kids to school, and you're trying to convince them that they should come to your local reading room, which you formed in the village, you also want to say that this will improve your lot. And there were ways you could show it easily. Uh, you said to people, you produced brochures that told you how to do better hog farming. And in the local reading room, you read the text to people who couldn't read to explain to them how you raised better hogs or whatever, how you did better things with your fields. And they were likely to think, yeah, I'd like to read it myself. You know, why do I need somebody else to read it for me? I'm going to join this and be part of it. So you, you also have the, this change as well as they begin to collect all of this folklore and ethnographic material. Uh, well, can this be useful to us? Uh, uh, can uh, my local carpenter who makes these beautiful old-fashioned houses that nobody knows how to make outside of this mountain region, you know, you know, maybe we can sell some of this. You know, maybe there are people in the cities who want this. Maybe there are museums in Vienna and Basel, as there were, who want some of these uh, exhibitions. I, uh, uh, Zubritsky was in touch with these museums, and they're interested in models of how, do, how did the agricultural implements look. And so a local specialist made nice little models. These, uh, we have lost almost all of the original ones, but I went to Basel and they came and they pulled out a box and showed me that Mr. Petrushkovich's models are still there because people in 1900 in Basel we're trying to study in their ethnographic museum general, uh, general cultures, and this was part of it. The other thing that we're going on is scholarly societies. Because there was no Ukrainian state, the Ukrainians formed their own civic societies for culture. And that society is trying to, and there's, there is conflict between Poles and Ukrainians over who should be the dominant group in the province, and something called the Shevchenko Scientific Society is formed. Now, it wants to, it puts out an ethnographic periodical. It wants all these materials for its museum collection. How do you get them? 
And remember, distances are far. Railroads are only coming in in the 1870s and 80s. Who's going to do all of this? Well, if you've got your, <coughs> if you're, if you're France, although France didn't do as good a job as it might have for these folk, folk, folklore things, you know, you've got government money, you send out expeditions, you hire people and they do it. But what if you don't? Well, what, what you need then are local activists. And who's a better local activist than the village priest? All right? He's there, he's on the spot. You know, everyone has to come into contact with him. And so Zabritsky worked well as that conduit. Now, it didn't work well all the time. There is a nice letter of Zabritsky who writes to another major ethnographer, and he says, look, I need you to come up because they won't tell me the dirty stories. And if, if we're going to get these written down, it can't be done by the priest. So, uh, uh, so if we want sexual mores, we need other people, really, to tell us. Uh, uh, what people actually said and not what the, uh, what the uh, priests have left us. And sometimes the village school teacher might join in this, but in these areas, the village school teachers tended to be Polish because they were appointed by the government and they were less interested in, they were supporting Polish similar activities. Now, what's the methodology that uh, Father Zabritsky uses? Yeah, 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 and I think I can make most of it, okay. And I hope it has some re relevance on your other topics as well. First of all, he did a very interesting thing. He went around to all the household, by the way, I don't call the people in the village peasants yet, because that's our construct. They, you know, some of them had been free, some of them were petty nobles, some of them had rights as uh, from a long time when somebody had served in an army. Some of them are shepherds who do other things. They're a very diverse population that we now tend to somehow label together. But much of the society is illiterate. But what he does is goes from house to house and saying, do you have any documents? Now, why is that interesting? Because usually we study history top down. We go to an archive of an institution and we see what it tells us. What he was doing was saying, what do these people, what did they keep and why did they keep it? And why are certain kinds of documents here or not, and not here? Now, it's not always easy because a lot of documents people tend to keep are wills and property rights. And if you are illiterate, you don't know what's in the document. And you're afraid that your neighbor may have a claim to you know, some field that you own, right? So you've got to convince people. It took them a long time, and that I think all ethnographers find. How do you get people to trust you? And uh, some of these are published in this. The second thing he did that was, was today I think looks so modern, was he then tried to verify documents by discussing oral tradition. So if a document said there used to be a gate on the edge of the village, he would go around and say, does anybody remember anybody saying anything about this gate? Why is that so valuable? Because the society is not contaminated yet by the written word. Within another generation, there's so many literate people that you don't have any idea whether they read about it or they were told about it. And of course, none of us remember what, how we gathered information. The, Third thing that he did that was so interesting, and Ivan Franco says about them, he was willing to sit and listen to the meandering and seemingly non-thematic endless tales of the villagers and write them down. And of course, the problem of all, all this gathering of material is do people come with an agenda? Do they have already an interview form? And do they only write down what they want? And what Zubritsky did was recreate what they were saying. And then later, it makes it possible for us to organize it in new ways. He also observed material culture. And he, uh, in some of those books I passed around, he was not good at drawing. So luckily, the next village of priest's daughter was good at drawing. And, so she draws coffins and tells us about you know, how funerals were conducted. But you actually have the physical coffins in these volumes. What he was doing 
was he was describing, and this I think is, I don't know if, it, if it's universal for ethnography and folklore, but people collect at a time they think the world is disappearing that they are describing. And that if they don't write this down, it's not going to exist. It seems to be very important for ethnographic and folklore materials. And uh, uh, Zubritsky definitely felt that, and it was in many ways doing it. He was doing it for all kinds of reasons. By 1900, people in large numbers began to depart for the US. They got on boats, went across the water, and suddenly uh, all culture after that is also affected by North American culture. In this case, definitely US and not Canadian. Other groups, other villages, t villages tended to go to one place or another and followed each other along. Uh, the other thing is that Zubritsky was destroying the very base he was describing. Because he believed in spreading literacy, better ways of farming, new ways of treating things. So he's destroying that traditional world as he's copying it down. Now, thank God he also copied it down. So he does both of them. <coughs> now, what are the kinds of things I think are most useful here? And then I will be done in time for, uh, for uh, your slideshow and most interesting carol. Uh, above all, he wrote about things that we would call modern social history. He went around and said, how, were, how did people feel when their, their sons were first recruited but to the army in the early 19th century? And people in 1880 still could tell you about the tragedies of 1810 because village societies particularly non-literate ones, have long memories. It could tell you about the world of the recruits. In 1847-8, I'm a day late discussing this matter, uh, there was a potato famine in Galicia. Uh, and uh, the potato famine uh, meant that many people fled across the mountains into Bukovina, another part of these territories. Uh, and uh, uh, Zubritsky wrote down all of the various decrees that were the government, and the Austrian government dealt much better than the British government did. Uh, if you wanted to took it to two societies, much more of an understanding of how to save people. It wasn't quite, quite as bad, and they had a place to go. Uh, but the other side is, he, he carried, there are a number of ballads about the potato. Why potato have you abandoned us and turned away from us? Well, we would never have these if he had not copied them down. So this combination was very important. He wrote an article about a cholera epidemic, what the government did, what people did, what people said about cholera, because remember, people are learning about medicine. I understand it's a little hard for us to accept this when we have just lived through a society that didn't seem to learn much by COVID, but you know, people are learning you know, that there are infections or bad water or why you get sick is not from some external force, but from something going on. And he wrote above all about the trade in sheep and lamb and the lambs in the mountain. The people from these mountain villages would go to a higher mountain area to buy lambs and sell it to people in lower mountain villages. And he described the whole trade network and how it worked and who helped whom and how they did it. So all of this, he, and, he, and he could talk with the people who did it and then have the documents. And then to finish, what I will say is what you needed as well were consumers and patrons if you were going to get ethnographic material. So I told you about the scholarly journal that needed it. And Zubritsky is eventually given, in 1904, membership in the highest scholarly society among Ukrainians. This was you know, almost unheard of that a village priest would get this, right? Because he wasn't, you know, he, he didn't have a normal tenured position, uh, so you don't treat people seriously. But he was actually doing this kind of work. He, he, was, he was writing to these museums in writing to some major European museum organizer in Basel and trying to explain to him that no, uh, Ukrainians are not Russians. Uh, we are a very different people. You know, something that Ukrainians still seem to have to repeat today. Uh, 
He was dealing with state institutions. And one of the things, the great Habsburg Empire was a multinational empire. I think closest, if you want to think about the Habsburg Empire, think of India today. You know, uh, what is Indian culture? Who, what, what are, how can you describe India? And in the 19th century, the Habsburg Empire decides to describe all of these peoples. And it sends people out. But they also believed in anthropological types. You know, that there were certain type of people. And they begin to do drawings, and they take photographs uh, of this as well. And they get money from the Vienna Museum for this. Above all, in 1904, the so-called Boyko expedition comes to Mshanetz. It comes there because Zubritsky is the friend of all these Ukrainian scholars, and they need a place to stay. Uh, we have very little, by the way, indication of what the good Dobrodika Zubritska, the priest's wife, did, but she had to organize, I'm sure, all, all of these meals and whatever events that occurred for all these scholars. And they are trying to decide who are boykos. So ethnographic groups are often modern creations. You, don't, you always have to think about when they are first used. You know, we use them very loosely. We tend to teach our students that national categories are modern creations, and then treat ethnographic categories as if they are ancient. They are also transformative, changing, influenced by the outer world, and what these people are deciding are who are the boykos at that time. And above all, Zubritsky has come back due to the work of Dr. Bogdan Klied and Halina Klied, but also because of scholars in Ukraine, for a recent Christmas carol, or carol of the season, uh, that reached all of Ukraine this Christmas, and my colleague uh, Bogdan Klied will address that further, of how then culture copied down in 1885, recycled in 2022, three. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Frank. Uh, thank you, Larissa, and um, good morning. Um, I want to begin by um, going back to how I started to get interested in this topic and what grabbed my attention. When the war, started in February of 2022. Um, I began almost religiously watching the afternoon or evening news from Ukraine. And on the 25th of December of 2023, last year, I was watching a uh, TV news program called T um, a TV news program uh, by Ukrainian television, TSN, uh, by the TSN network. And lo and behold, there was a, uh, a long feature story that um, just was mesmerizing and grabbed my attention. It was called In Search of a Carol. And this is where we get the connection with Dr. Sisson's um, research on uh, bringing to light uh, Mikhail Zubritsky's materials and writings. And Basically, um, the um, news story was called In Search of a Carol, and it's the Carol of Saint Sophia. So on this title page, you will see um, a uh, photograph of a mosaic that's in of the Mother of God, which is located in Saint Sophia with her hands raised in prayer. The Mother of God features very prominently in the carol. The carol can basically be divided into two parts. The first part deals with how the cathedral was constructed, or actually reconstructed, because it was first constructed in the 11th century and then reconstructed again in the 17th century. And the second part of the carol um, deals with a war, basically. Um, in the 17th century, when the cathedral was, was being um, reconstructed, is also a period of wars in Ukraine, and a war for, um, you, you can say, almost an anti-colonial war 
1648 by a Ukrainian Cossack um, leader called Bogdan Khmelnytsky. So the second part of the carol again deals with the war and specifically it's um, how a Polish army besieged the cathedral of Saint Sophia and was destroyed through the intervention of the Mother of God who sent down a fiery rain and destroyed the Polish army. So this is the second slide shows the today's view of the Cathedral of St. Sophia, uh, the reconstructed view, and then to the other side is a model of what the cathedral could have looked like uh, when it was originally constructed. The um, carol, again, was composed in the 17th century, the period of the Reconstruction, and uh, <clears throat> the the first part contains details on the interior of the cathedral. A historian from Ukraine, Ihor Nedokhatkin, believes the text of the carol was composed by a craftsman from the Mashanich area who um, took, part in the, took part in the reconstruction efforts and who was intimately familiar with the cathedral's structure and interior. And if you read the text of the carol, you'll see that uh, uh, there are certain details that are given or, or, uh, or uh, provided in the carol. Now, the Hatkin later wrote an article on the carol of St. Sophia and used the text of the carol in an analysis of the cathedral itself. So he's, he's the world, or he's the leading expert in Ukraine on the, on, on the study of the cathedral of St. Sophia. Uh, the third slide shows Mikhailo Zubretsky, who discovered the carol, and I use quotation marks because the carol had existed, of course, but Zubretsky wrote it down and then gave it to his friend and colleague, um, an intellectual giant, a schoolmate of his, who, with whom he re retained a friendship all of his life. Franco copied the text of the carol and along with 18 other carols that Zubritsky had noted down, he recognized its uniqueness, became intrigued by the fact that although the carol was concerned with the Cathedral of Saint Sophia, which is in the capital city, Kiev, it was only sung and known in that Mashanich area. So this is a mystery. How is it that, you know, the, the carol Carol came to be composed and sung in only this remote area of Ukraine and not known in Kiev itself. So, getting back to the TV feature story, a journalist for TSN TV, Nelly Kowalska, composed the feature news story on the history of the Carol and its fate based in part on a long interview with the historian Ihor Nedokhatkin, who, um, and um, it contains an interview with him, and in the story, she also takes a long trip to the village of Mishanich, together with a TV news crew, and um, after arriving at the village, she interviewed the local priest, and two elderly men, elders of the village, one of which was a village cantor who was singing, who sang the carol. So up until this time, no one knew the actual melody of the carol. The text existed because it existed in print. It was published in the, in the late 19th century. But no one knew what the melody was. So in the trip to the village, the village cantor sings the um, carol, and that's how we learn of what the melody is. So the carol, in effect, is rediscovered. <laughs> Hey, Bożeku, you pomyłeś, że nasz hospod. 
Nech tam ne bolo, da naši na voda, naši na voda, tej bili kamen je Božejku. Hej, Božejku je pomiluj, že nas gospod. Pokrylo gospo sero v zemlece u Božejku. Hej, Božejku je pomiluj, že nas gospod. Ok, that's just an excerpt from the carol. But, um, so he wrote down the words to the carol that he had heard as a young man, uh, he claims 50 years ago. And the words are a bit different from the text that uh, was printed in the 19th century. Um, because he uh, changes the Polish arm, he changes the text in the second part of the carol, it's not the Polish army that's besieging the cathedral, but a Turkish army. And he also uses a boycott dialect word for the word God. The word God in Ukrainian is Boch, and he uses the diminutive form and the local dialect form, Bozheko. So the, this next slide, the last part of the Nelly Kowalska's feature story, showed Tina Karol, a well-known Ukrainian pop star, singing the carol on Christmas Day, um, which is when the news story first aired on TSN TV in Ukraine. Uh, Karol sang the carol, incorporating the sound of bells. She also, she changed the words of the carol herself um, regarding the siege of the cathedral. Instead of singing the Polish army, as in the original text, or Turkish army, she changed it to Muscovite army. And in doing so, she connected the, um, uh, uh, the carol, which was composed in the 17th century, to today's war, because she's obviously referring to the Russians. The, the term Muscovite is also used for Russian. Um, so. If you recall, back in late February, early March, the Russians' army was threatening Kiev, the capital city, and so um, the uh, Russian army was repelled, of course, but military analysts and political leaders outside of Ukraine believed that Ukraine would quickly succumb to the Russian assault. Everyone that was featured on television, if you recall from that period, uh, that were analysts, military analysts, said the Ukrainian army would not uh, be able to handle the Russian assault, the Russians would, would quickly capture Kiev, and the war would be over quite quickly. This did not happen. So what, in effect, took place, one can look at as a miracle, the miracle of the defense of Kiev and the defeat of the Russian army at the gates of Kiev. So let's listen to Tina Karol. Прикрив Господь сиро в землецю, виросло на ній кедрову древу, висмотріла го пресвята діва Божеку. Ей, Божеку, і помило же нас Господь. Ой, найняла в нас сімдесят майстрів, ось ви майстрові, ви ремісники. Ой, зрубайте ж велике древо, древо, виставте з нього святу Софію, святу Софію, в святінки Йогі, бо на ній було сімдесят верхів, а околочок, як на небзірок, єдин вершойко дуже високий, під тим вершойком золотий престіл Божику. Гей, Божику, і помили же нас Господь. Там 
туди лежить, давно стежка, стежкою йде москальська війна Божейко. Гей, Божейко, і помилуже нас Господь. Стала війнонька в крижі стріляти, і спустив Господь огнений дождик, огняний дождик, громові кулі, затопив Господь москальську війну Божейку. Ей, Божейко, і помилуй же нас Господь, би на здров'я нам на ноги літа. А з милим Богом, і з милим Богом, Господи Нейко, з Господи Нейко, вищеля дойко, Божейку. Ей, Божейку, і помилуй же нас, an idea of what um, she did with that carol and how she incorporated the bells. And because she's a pop singer, uh, she gave it a kind of a uh, popular sound to it, right? Now, what really makes this story intriguing is that um, independently of all of this, the, uh, there are others who sing this carol. One of them is one of the singers, or people, is uh, um, featured here. Uh, the band is called Wiseword.Nedaras, and a dark folk band. And I'll play it quickly so you can get an idea. The group re recreated their own. The group did not know of the existence of the original melody and created their own. So here it goes. Ой, не було ж нам хіба сина вода, славен є з Боже, бою всім світу і на небесі. Сина я вода, та й білий камінь, славен є з Боже, бою всім. Окей. So here's the final. Виросло на нім кедрове древо, барс височайке і барслічне гейке. Вигне діла го пресвята діва, зізвала днему сорок ремісний кіл. Вийдіте ж ви, ремісничайки, а зітніте ж ви кедрове древо, збудуйте з нього святу Софію, святу Софію, святим Києм. Окей, so another independent rendition of the song by a minstrel and hurdy-gurdy player. Again, independently of uh, the original melody. So finally, my final slide here is, um, in case you're interested, the um, article that I wrote um, with, um, in, in consultation with Dr. Sisson, with the help of, uh, of my spouse, Helena, and uh, having um, consulted with others as well and looked at literature and research um, of uh, the various uh, writings about um, the carol that uh, was done in the 19th and 20th century, er, an early part of the 20th centuries, um, I, I came up with this article and was published at the end of January. And in the article, you'll have all of the links to the uh, news stories, um, the um, um, audio of the uh, dark folk group, if you're interested in that, the audio or the video of the um, um, minstrel player 
and also the uh, cantor singing the complete carol, and Tina Caro, the pop singer, singing the carol in front of the Cathedral of St. Sophia. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Frank and Mokdan, for joining us today. Uh, I just want to thank you very much for sharing this really live example of uh, collecting um, materials, ethnographic materials, and then sharing why we would do it, why um, Mikhailo Subritsky would have done it, and then why uh, we would go back and look at words that were spoken in the past and how relevant uh, looking at, do they apply now? It, uh, how is, how is, uh, what, what are all the connections? And anyway, we'll see you all on Wednesday.